just going to give a quick rattle through just some of the key things we've been working on, first of all, in IWEA, and then may talk a little bit about where we are as in sector overall. So just to start with a few important developments that I'd really like to make sure, especially for the members here at the conference, to be up to speed on some of our new things we've worked on over the last six months since our last conference. The first thing I just wanted to make every sure everyone is aware of is we have a new three-year strategy for IWEA that was approved by our council over the summer months. This sets out what IWEA is going to try and achieve for the next three years, and it's available to all members to have a look at. It's, it's on our new website site under our corporate governance section. So definitely check that out if you want to see what we're working on as an organization on a day-to-day -day basis on your behalf. There's also nine goals in there that we're trying to achieve over the next three years. For example, the first goal in that is to get best practice in community engagement. Goal four in there is to make sure that wind energy is the lowest cost form of energy in Ireland over the next decade. So some very ambitious targets that we've set ourselves in that strategy. So definitely worth having a look at it. In order to make ourselves, let's say, fit for purpose, that strategy led to the creation of a number of new committees to make sure that we're actively working on all of the key topics that the members want us to look at. So that's what Peter just mentioned. We now have 10 committees spread across a lot of different areas in IWEA, and two of those today actually have some breakout sessions that are happening in a, in a room just uh, there'll be about 30 30 space for about 30 or 35 people our new storage and asset management committees and that hopefully is something you spotted on the agenda that was a bit new for for this conference that we haven't done before and the other eight committees are all listed up there as well and there's a full let's say dedicated website for each of those committees on the IWEA homepage so if ever as a member you want to check out what is actually going on what is the committee dealing with you can always go to the website and have a look at what are the latest documents and results and analysis being carried out by each of those committees. Another very important development that we've had over the last uh, few months in IWEA is a new corporate governance. This is to make sure that we're governing the organization in a fit-for-purpose way to implement our new strategy. And one of the key highlights or key changes you could say in that is that we have a council that defines our strategy, which is made up of 24 people. So that's where this document has been produced and created. And our council is our ultimate decision maker. And we also have a board then that meets a bit more regular to ensure the day-to-day -day operations of IWEA are being carried out. And the reason I just wanted to, to, to mention this to you today is that there is a call for nominations for people to get elected to council opening up for the next few weeks. The deadline is the 25th of October, and there's forms on the IWEA desk here today for any members who are here who would like to see themselves more involved in the decision making that we do in IWEA, in defining the strategic direction of IWEA. Please go to the IWEA stand, Take a nomination form if it's for yourself. Try and find two other members to nominate you. Or if you have someone in mind, feel free to nominate someone for that election. As I said, the 25th of October is the closing date. And then we'll have an online election that will mean results will be announced around the 8th of, of November. So four seats are available to our, our council for this year. So uh, as I said, I just want to make sure that all of our members know there's this window of opportunity to get more involved in telling me what to do. So how could you refuse something like that? Um, then the, uh, that, that's just to give you a flavor of where, where IWEA has been at as an organization. So we have a new website, some new committees, a new corporate governance. So we have a lot of new structures put in place that we will hope to see us carry out this three-year strategy very effectively over the next few years. And of course, our main role on a day-to-day -day basis is to make sure that you as an industry are represented as best as possible. So I'm just going to give a flavor of some of the things that we're working on and some of the things we're monitoring at the very moment. So just to give a, first of all, a status of the wind industry, I think it's appropriate, considering ISEM just went live uh, very recently, to start by highlighting that is one of the most intriguing and interesting things the industry is currently adjusting to accommodate. Went live on the, on the 1st of October, Feedback we're getting from members is that balancing market and intraday market are not so bad, doing okay, but we have a pretty volatile balancing market out there right now, and they're seeing some pretty extreme prices, even as high as 1,400 euros a megawatt hour two days ago, which is raising a few eyebrows and creating a bit of concern. But it's something that we hope will, let's say, get resolved as, as things get bedded in, but something we're monitoring very, very closely. And just to point out that Quiva Gibbons from Electroroute, very much looking forward to her talk in the second session of the day, where she's going to take us through the, the details of what exactly they're noticing in the first almost 10 days of, of ISEM activity. One of the other things we can see already is that the change in refit in, for, for refit wind projects in terms of the reference price that was used has 
helps things to somewhat. Originally, it was meant to be referenced against the day-ahead market price, and in the end, we got the lower of day-ahead or 80-20 blend, and that's definitely helping some members deal with the extra volatility we're seeing in the balancing market. And you can see that in the graph, that the, the reference price is around 13 euros megawatt hour lower than it would have been if we were in the day-ahead market, which is definitely helping in terms of accommodating some of the volatility that we're seeing. So very much looking forward to, to Quiva's talk overall. And so what are we, what do we represent in this new market? Well, wind so far this year is 27.5% of all electricity production in Ireland. This time last year, that equated to around 25%. And by the end of last year, we were around 27% in total because we'll expect a windier autumn and winter than we've had year to date. So we're very much expecting that wind will be about 30% of all electricity production by the end of this year. So we're finally into the 3-0 bracket, or about to break through the 3-0, 30% bracket of electricity contribution into the Republic of Ireland. So massive progress still being made year on year. And while we're doing this, something that has often frustrated us as your representatives in the corridors of power has been the recognition of just of the PSO and the cost of developing a new industry in the form of wind energy. And what we've always been trying to explain to the powers that be is that wind energy was a very effective policy from a cost point of view because we have one of the cheapest PSOs in all of Europe. And this is relatively well known. You might see this slide presented in a few other places. It's, uh, I've seen it presented by the energy regulator on, on numerous occasions. Ireland has one of the lowest PSOs in, in all of, of Europe. So what we uh, took upon, uh, what IWEA carried out um, over the course of the last few months is a study to look at, well, if the PSO is quite low compared to other countries in Europe, and we know that the price of electricity is reduced by having wind power, what is the effect of both of these together? And later this, uh, in session two as well, we have Beringa presenting the first results from that study, which shows that at a net cost, wind energy is costing every household in Ireland about one euro per year. So the myth that the PSO is a very severe burden for the consumer to bear is counteracted to a large degree by the savings that we're bringing to the electricity market also. So please, uh, I'm sure you'll find that talk later by uh, Dr. Mark Turner from Baringa. Very interesting to see how they've come to that conclusion. And that includes not just the PSO cost, all costs of networks being reinforced, DS3 costs, and so on. So we have a very, very positive story to tell. We'll be representing 30% of the electricity production in Ireland by the end of this year. Clean, green, local energy with a very minor cost to the consumer overall, not just because we have a low cost in the PSO compared to other countries, but we also are saving the consumer significant money in the electricity market also. And that's just a status of where we're, let's say, where the industry is today. And we have, a, we have let's say, two worlds kind of happening at the moment in IWEA. We have a 2020 world, which is where we're seeing the end of the, of the refit scheme, the gate three scheme, and all of these measures that were put in place, let's say, 10, 12 years ago. So we have these, let's say, 2020 agenda items we're very much working on. And then we have the construction of a new framework for wind, which is how do we set up the 2030 picture for wind energy. So we, we kind of have two worlds day to day, you could say, as I, we as staff that we're, we're trying to handle in, in parallel. And the first thing I'll just give you a flavor of is, is for 2020, where are we at? So 2020 is all about the 40% renewable electricity target, trying to get us uh, over the line on at least one of our energy targets. We, we are the only hope to reach one of our energy targets for, for 2020, and we still very much believe we can do that. Uh, we're at the end of 2017, there was about 3,300 megawatts of wind in Ireland. To hit the 40% renewable electricity target, we've estimated we need about 4,300 megawatts by the end of 2020. And just to put into context what that means, because like we often get lost in the story of renewable electricity, sometimes what we forget is it's not just a renewable electricity story, it's a renewable energy story. And wind in Ireland is carrying almost the bulk of the load in terms of trying to get Ireland not just to a renewable electricity target, but a renewable energy target. So the renewable energy target for Ireland for 2020 was 16%. And out of that, wind was expected to contribute around 7 to 8% of that. So the wind industry was expected to take about half, or provide around, around half of the overall renewable air and energy share for 2020. And what has happened is the other sectors, heat and transport, have really struggled and are likely to fall short by about 3%, 
which means Ireland is now on track to get to 13 out of the 16. And out of that 13, we're still very much on track to deliver 7 to 8% of that. So the wind industry is about to become 7 to 8% of renewable energy that represents 13% overall. And that's just to give people a sense of why it's so important that we are successful as an industry, because we don't just have a huge impact on what we achieve in renewable electricity, we have a significant impact on what we're achieving in terms of overall renewable energy also. And we're breaking records on a regular basis. 2017 was a record year, over 500 megawatts delivered in a single year for the very first time in Ireland. So we've proven as an industry we have the capability to deliver at scale year by year and, and grow year by year. But of course, as we get closer to 2020, it becomes more challenging. And one of our biggest challenges is not that we don't have enough projects. So when we look at our members, we know that there's still a lot of projects still in the pipeline, still part of refit. Our latest projections suggest that we have the ability to deliver around 4,300, 4,400 megawatts by 2020, about 350 megawatts we expect this year, and over 500 megawatts again next year, if the projects that can deliver will deliver. But our big concern, of course, is the deadline, the cliff edge deadline that comes with the refit scheme. If you miss the, the build deadline at the start of in March 2020, then it starts to become very risky that you can actually fund a project today. And we're very much engaged with the department right now, asking for some leniency around that very stiff deadline in March 2020, so that we can ensure that the projects that are in the pipeline do actually make it onto the grid before the end of 2020. And as a result, making sure Ireland does at least meet one of its 2020 renewable electricity targets. So that's very much one of the key focuses we have as IWEA on behalf of you, our members at the moment, trying to make sure that the, de the dependency that Ireland has on, renew on wind energy contributing to not just Res E, but renewable energy overall is appreciated and given every opportunity to succeed since it is the one that can still deliver at bulk uh, before the, the 2020 deadline. And for 2030 then, so what I, I was trying to give you the flavour of, that's very much trying to meet targets, build projects, meet deadlines, and get things that are in the pipeline that have been around for many years actually delivered on time and contributing to that 2020 target. For 2030, you could say it has been a very good year for, for Ireland, at least better than expected. You know, I would say the report card is, is, is came home, maybe not with an A, but definitely a better grade than we expected. But it's definitely, this year has been a year of building the foundations of an industry for the next 10 years. So just to explain what I mean by that, if you take a snapshot of 2020, the things that drove the industry were having an overall target for 2020, having the ability to finance projects through refit, having an ability to connect to the grid through grade three, and having a wind energy guidelines that were manageable for the industry to develop within. And each of these, and Peter kind of reflective on, on his opening kind of remarks, you know, there was high risks associated with many of these, but this year we're starting to see some more certainty come through on, on things like this. So over the last 12 months, I would say I've given a plus sign as in we've seen positive developments, very much a step in the right direction. We always want more and we will continue to push for more, but at least we're seeing things move in a direction that we're pleased with. We have a target indicative of 55% renewable electricity for 2030. The European Commission, I'm sure maybe Giles might mention this, will only allow you to negotiate up, so that's a minimum, and that's something we'll be encouraging goes up in the next uh, few months, but at least it's a very positive start. It's, it's showing ambition, uh, and that was through the raise consultation that that was signaled, and over the next few months, we're going to get a bit more certainty around that. In terms of financing, we have RAISE. RAISE has a picture of what the pipeline is and what they want to deliver. That's a very positive development also. ECP had its first results through ECP1 with 600 megawatts of wind getting a grid offer for the first time in about 10 years. Again, a very positive development overall and something we're glad to see has started to come again. And of course, we still have one big question mark that may come before the end of this year, which is the new wind energy guidelines. And for those of you who haven't been monitoring it closely, there was some new noise regulations released by the World Health Organization yesterday in Switzerland, which we'll need to get our teeth into straight after this conference. So it's something we're hoping we can put a positive remark beside in, in the near future. But it look, it's, it's, it's very positive moving forward. I'm not going to dwell too much on um, 
uh, these, the, the grid and planning, I'll just make a few comments about the, the res, which is just to make sure you're aware that we have some really good talks coming up at the rest of this conference is focusing on res. So it's, such a, it's such a new and positive development. We have James Goldsmith in the second session of the day talking about auction design and how res could work and, and what aspects of the auction design we need to be watching as an industry to make sure we get right. And then we have a, a, a Justin Moore, in my, our head of public affairs and communications in IWEA, will give a talk about what we're working on in IWEA in, in relation to community engagement in RAISE, which is a fundamental part of, of RAISE into the future. So some two very specific talks around the, the RAISE scheme and how we as an industry will need to interact with it. We also have a video for any members in the room. We developed a short 10 minute video that summarizes the key parts of the RAISE high level design. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's a good way to get your quick 101 of what is in the RAISE document, what does it entail, and what does it mean, mean for the industry, and it's available on, on our website. One thing I just want to make sure uh, highlight is that our view in some of the 2030 framework has been that in relation to, let's say, auction designs, grids, planning, we, we will constantly be working on those. But one thing that definitely sets the agenda over the long run is that target. In other words, the 2020 target kept everyone honest as things changed over time about what we were trying to deliver and what we were trying to achieve. And over the next three months, there's a huge window of opportunity for Ireland to set, we have to go back to the European Commission by the end of the year with some indication as to what our 2030 target is going to be. And so we and I, we uh, looked at this as an opportunity to really set a tone as to what we felt we could deliver as an industry. So I've already mentioned around for 2020, we saw ourselves as the backbone of what Ireland was trying to deliver in relation to renewable energy. And we just see that as a point in time, not as an end date. We want to make sure we're still seen as an industry that can be the backbone of what Ireland needs to deliver, not just to 2020, but out to 2030. And so the Energy Systems Committee in IWEA has been working very hard over the last 12 months to develop our energy vision for 2030, which outlines how Ireland could get to 70% renewable electricity in 2030. And this is a really excellent piece of work. It's detailed hour by hour modeling of Ireland's electricity system in, 2020, in 2030. And it doesn't just show how, how wind can contribute to uh, electricity. We've uh, demonstrated how we can start to provide low cost renewable energy to heat and transport also, primarily through the electrification of heat with heat pumps and the electrification of transport via electric vehicles. We are no longer a renewable electricity solution we are a renewable energy solution, not just for electricity, but for heat and transport also. And this is very much setting our agenda for the consultation that's likely to come in the next week or two that the department are going to release about what should Ireland's 2030 strategy be. And make sure if any of you are involved in any stakeholder engagement or submissions to response to that, IWEA has set a very solid platform as to what we believe is not only possible, but this is the really promising result also cost neutral for the consumer. So this is a fully costed analysis of what do we need to do over the next 10 years to achieve a 70% renewable electricity system and how much is it going to cost. And it comes back as cost neutral for the consumer with some very conservative assumptions. So the key result was if wind can deliver on average at 60 euros a megawatt hour over the next 10 years, this is cost neutral. And in our view, that's putting wind energy not in a place where we can be cost comparable, but I would be very confident as an industry we can deliver at lower than that over the next 10 years. And that's one of the, the, the bodies of work that you'll also see one of our members, Bill Sadler, present about in the second session where we've been doing a bit of work in the Energy Systems Committee about what does policy and industry need to do to get us to below 60 euros a megawatt hour as fast as possible. What components are making up the cost of a typical wind farm in Ireland today, and how can that be made leaner to get us as fast as possible to below 60 euros a megawatt hour? And other jurisdictions with lower wind resources than us are already there today, so we should be at least matching that, if not even lower, going out over the next 10 years. And that's the ambition, I think, where this industry needs to see itself. We are no longer just a clean energy provider, we are a low cost of energy provider also. And that is a monumental shift, you could say, for a renewable energy industry over the last two to three years, where we are now becoming lower cost than the alternative fossil fuel opportunity. And something we're very keen that the policymakers 
are aware of. We launched this report only last week. We had it as a combined launch with many of the other renewable energy industries, solar and bioenergy, and we had some really great speakers in John Fitzgerald and Mary Donnelly, and we got some really good publicity out of it, and we know the minister has it in his hand, so hopefully he will read it and see what the opportunity is. So we're really excited about, let's say, demonstrating what we can continue to deliver over the next 10 years. A fundamental part to the, our success over the next 10 years is not just low cost energy, but best practice and significant engagement with local communities. So we have a full session today dedicated to hear about how can we improve and build on the community engagement we've done in the past to make sure we're delivering not just from energy side but also in terms of engagement in the future. We're going to get some really interesting talks, one from Andy Fox, one of our own members, about what life on the ground is like as a developer nowadays going into communities and trying to develop a project. We have the Honourable Mary Lafoy who was leading, chaired the Citizens Assembly to give us a flavour of what, the, what she would have taken away as a, as a wider public perception of the wind industry during that experience. And we have Sinead Dooley from Irish Rural Inc. who will tell us what it's like to be in a community and have wind energy projects come in. What, is, what does the world look like from their perspective and what do they feel that they need from, from a project that comes in? And if we get this right, and I am very confident we can, the opportunity for rural Ireland in particular is absolutely monumental. When we looked at this 70 by 30 scenario, we looked at how much community benefit will this transition bring to rural Ireland and it was over 250 million euro in direct community benefit going into areas of Ireland that could really do with a boost. So if we can get this right, the opportunity not just for wider society to have clean cost effective energy but also for areas where we're developing wind energy projects to benefit is absolutely enormous. I think we have a very wonderful product to sell over the next 10 years that can bring huge benefits, not just to Ireland Inc, but to many local areas around Ireland also. So a key focus for us. And outside of the headlines, the news is promising. I had to give a special mention, considering we're in Galway, to some of the really good research being carried out by NUIG, where they went and surveyed 250 people for 40 minutes each, living within four kilometers of a wind farm. And as part of that survey, they said, if given the choice, would you keep or get rid of the wind farm? And 75% of people said, with appropriate community engagement, we'll keep it. So in other words, we have mass support, not just amongst the wider public, which we saw through the Citizens' Assembly, but within areas living near wind farms also. But we just need to ensure that we have absolute best practice in how we engage with those communities to bring them with us, rather than create barriers between us. So a huge uh, opportunity that lies ahead. And I think Ireland has a big question to answer over the next few months. Will we continue to be laggards, as Taoiseach Leo Varadkar mentioned earlier this year, or will we set ourselves a leadership position and match the 2030 target that the EU have set of 32% renewable energy? And that's very much the topic of debate in our final panel of the day. We have Martin Finucane from the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment, who's heavily involved in the development of the National Energy and Climate Plan that will set our 2030 target. We have Sean Kelly, MEP from Brussels, who was very deep in the negotiations of setting Europe's 32% renewable energy target for 2030. John Fitzgerald from Airgrid, who will explain to us how we can keep the lights on while uh, the wind is blowing and not blowing. So very well, and, and with the work that, uh, fantastic work that Airgrid are doing, especially through their DS3 program, in making sure they can accommodate higher levels of wind energy. Our own Peter Hart, who's very involved in the wind industry, but also heavily involved in a new interconnector project, GreenLink. And then uh, our own head of policy, Anne-Marie McCaig, to give you some insights into the IWEA views on all of these things. So that'll be our final session today, getting a sense of how Ireland can set that ambitious, achievable, cost-effective target for 2030. So a big thank you to everyone for coming along today. Big thank you especially to speakers. A huge thanks to Enercon, our main sponsor for the day. Very much appreciate your support to make events like this possible. Um, exhibitors, our delegates, IWEA council and directors, chairs and members. You, many of you are involved in IWEA. For those who are not, whenever you meet a member who's involved in a chair or a committee, a council or a director, Give them a slight thank you because the work that the members put in behind the scenes to make sure that this industry has not just effective day-to-day -day operations but a future is, as somebody in IWEA, it's absolutely amazing to see the time and effort that our members give to us in order to make sure we can best represent you as, as an industry to the wider world. And a huge thanks to our own staff who work extremely hard on your behalf 
every day to make sure that we have not just good events like this, very good policy positions when we go to the, the stakeholders, very good research and training events, and, and a huge thanks to them for, for bringing all of this together. So look, I hope everyone enjoys the day. You got a flavor of where we are at as IWEA and some of the challenges we face day to day in both the 2020 and 2030 context that we're currently operating in. So have a, have a wonderful day at the conference and thanks again for everyone for coming and a huge thanks again to, to Enercon for their support in the event. Thanks a lot.